This is episode 10 and today is March the hmm, 22nd, 23rd, something like that, <laughs> 23rd I think, I lose track of time, um, 2024 and today my guest is Nachiketa and I'll just give you a little brief um, bio on Nach that you sent me. He was born in South Korea and adopted to the US when he was 10. He had a normal upbringing and after university, he decided to reconnect with his roots and move back to South Korea from uh, 2004 to 2014. After traveling around East Asia, he landed in Nepal where he lived for three and a half years and went on a mo motorcycle trek in 2018 for about 10 months around India and then decided to settle in a village in the Himalayas until now. Nachiketa spends his time researching various subjects and working on himself and he's still trying to figure out what in the world is going on, as a lot of people are, <laughs> probably most of us. So welcome, Natch. Well, thanks for having me, Amanda. I appreciate uh, you asking me to come on your uh, show and uh, to have this conversation with you. Great. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. I first saw you, I think it was a few months ago, you were on a round table with Brian Stavely. I've been following Brian for a few years now, probably since about 2015, 2016. And so I mm -hmm. saw you on a round table and then I subbed to your channel and then you started to share some videos. And so I've been sort of watching your stuff since and um, yeah. Um, but we can share your channel um, later with people so they can find you. But just getting back to um, your bio and your story, your life story. So do you want to just give us a little bit of a thumbnail sketch on on your childhood and, um, and yeah, how things went for you going from being born in Korea and then um, the, the culture shock going to America at such a young age? Yeah. Um, so... Like I talk about my uh, life on my channel, but like basically, uh, you know, I come from a bit of an aristocratic family, my father's side. Um, I don't know a lot about my mother, um, but long story short, uh, my father, um, you know, somehow, <laughs> you know, uh, ruined our family by, uh, you know, spending money and, and just going wild. I don't know exactly uh, all the details, but at least uh, he's somehow responsible for the downfall of our house. And uh, I was like a result of a kind of an affair with my biological mother. He was married already at the time. So it's a little bit of a messy uh, situation already. Um, of course, I didn't know any of this until uh, I came back to Korea, but basically uh, I was in different types of foster care because by the time I was already born, uh, my father didn't have a lot of money. My family didn't have a lot of money. So I ended up going um, into foster care uh, between like my uncles and aunts, grandparents. I remember at least 15 different places, but I was told that I probably lived over 100 different places. Uh, uh, yeah, from birth until like my orphanage. And uh, my father passed away when I was about eight and a half ish. And uh, I was living with my uncle in a small, like, you know, one room, you know, uh, apartment in Seoul, I guess. And then uh, after he passed away, I decided to run away. Uh, I didn't really feel like there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't anything for me, really. And uh, they were only taking care of me because my father was the oldest son. And they felt responsible for me, but I didn't really feel that uh, I was wanted uh, there, frankly speaking. And so I just, uh, it wasn't like a conscious decision that I'm going to run away. It was more like I didn't want to come home from school, you know, and then uh, it became nighttime. And, you know, like if I go home late, if they would get angry. So I just, you know, delayed <laughs> and it just, you know, found a place to stay. And then it just extended to like, you know, several weeks two months 
uh, like this. And then, you know, during that time being like eight years old, you do what you can to uh, survive. Um, it was uh, tough times, uh, you know, without a doubt. Uh, yeah. Basically, I'm glad I got that all out of the way, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, early on, you know, yeah. when uh, I could actually handle it. But yeah, that's that's part of the, uh, you know, early childhood experience, I would say. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And so how did you get from South Korea to the US? What happened there with, uh, so you're obviously adopted into a, a US family? Yes. So basically what happened was that, uh, um, uh, you know, I was in the streets and I was begging for food from a guy who, you know, shine wow. shoes, they fix shoes, they're like out in the streets. He went into a shop and then he bought like a, a little bit, of like, you know, a box of milk and bread. You know, they come in little uh, packages. Uh, he was handing it to me. And then before he gave it to me, he grabbed me and then he like took me to the police station. Um, you know, and like at, initially, of course, I was like a little bit, um, you know, uh, afraid and I, I didn't want to go. I was like, you know, used to being out in the streets at this point. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, I know this guy was kind of looking out for me in a way, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he he was concerned about my future and he probably didn't know, you know, where else uh, to take me. And this was like, you know, 1988, 87 South Korea at the time. So they're not really, you know, uh, modernized yet quite, you know, they were still uh, there's still things, you know, happening over there. And uh, I went to the police station uh, and then they transferred me to like a juvenile jail where I stayed for a couple of weeks. And I guess my family was uh, notified or something. And then from there, uh, I was uh, transferred to an orphanage where I stayed for about a year, year and a half. And, you know, um, there's a thing called like a statute of limitation about the, the age difference between, um, you know, the parents and the child. So for my fam like for my mother and my father, they were 55 at the time. Uh, I was I was the youngest child they could possibly adopt, you know, because the 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 limitation was 45 years apart. So I was chosen out of uh, uh, three boys uh, for them, you know, and that's yeah. kind of how I got adopted to my family in America. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. What what a massive experience at such a young age to go through all that. I can <laughs> only imagine. Wow. Yeah. And so how did you find America? I bet it would have been a little bit of a culture shock initially and not knowing the language or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was already a little bit illiterate uh, when I was in Korea just because I didn't really go to school. Um, and, uh, when I actually was at the orphanage, uh, that was the first time for me to sit down and go to, go to school. And I realized that I couldn't read, I couldn't write. I didn't know how to do basic math. Like, you know, I didn't know how to, uh, uh, add or divide or minus, or, you know, I'd never even seen those like symbols before. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. So actually I thought I was stupid, you know, like, because I just didn't know what was going on, you know, yeah. and I, I just accepted the fact that I wasn't going to going to understand and I'm just going to sit in the back and look out the window. So that was my uh, orphanage experience during school. Uh, and then when I came to the States, yes, I, I grew up in a small rural town of Ripon, Wisconsin, which is like, you know, 8,000, less than 8,000. Um, my father worked at a, a small private uh, uh, college there as a professor, very liberal, uh, you can imagine, you know, and um um, 99.99 percent of the population was white, <laughs> you know, yeah. except for my family. Uh, my parents are white, uh, and they have three children. Uh, you know, uh, a brother and two sisters who are of my biological parents' uh, children, and they decided to adopt uh, three children. Like I have two sisters from Korea, and I'm the youngest, but we're not blood related. So, yeah. as you can imagine, it was a uh, you know I, I was like you know kind of a little bit out of place in a place yeah. like that <laughs> yeah were you were you more of a novelty or did you get bullied or teased because of your different culture and your different ethnicity yeah I would say you know I was a bit of a target uh yeah. for uh, other kids for sure um you know and then uh I I would say like you know like I just stood out you know um like if I go to other towns where 
there was some kind of, uh, you know, fair or something, something going on, uh, everybody would be staring at me, you know, yeah. I, I just did not belong there yeah. at all, you know, but you get used to it, you get used to it. And you just handle it uh, the best you can. And uh, um, it actually strengthened me to, you know, uh, be able to travel without like really caring about being different from anybody else. So too, later on, you know, yeah. but it was difficult for sure yes. when you were like, you know, younger. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because most children, it's it's um, human nature, I guess, to want to fit in and to be accepted by your peers. So, you know, to already have the disadvantage to be, the only Asian person in that town at that time or with your other brother and sister as well. Yeah. I mean, even for me, I emigrated from England when I was seven and came to Australia. And, you know, like Australians are basically an English country anyway because we were colonized, Australia was colonized by the English, um, well, mostly English. But even that was a culture shock for me coming to a completely different culture. And, um, just being um, called a pommy or a limey or things like that as I was growing up in school and having a different accent because I was born in the north of Yorkshire. So I had a really, really strong North Yorkshire accent at the time. Um, yeah, so I, I can understand, but I probably only had a small fraction of that. You know, part of this um, people around me were I was a bit of a novelty and they wanted to get to know me, but then I got the other side of it, you know, the bullying. Yeah, and it is difficult as a child, but it does make you stronger and it makes you, um, as you say, you develop the skill of not really caring what other people think. Um, you know, like you just, yeah, you, you definitely grow a thick skin, that's for sure. So, and how I, was your... I did go through a period where, you know, I wanted to be blonde and blue-eyed, you know, uh, white, white child, you know, uh, that would make my life a lot easier and, uh, you know, more simpler and that that would uh, allow me to fit in. But, you know, uh, <laughs> it yeah. was a phase, you can say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I guess now we know, you know, um, with our spiritual practices that we chose to come in, you know, how and when we did and, and all that sort of stuff for soul lessons and, and soul development and things. So, yeah. So with your family mm -hmm. life, um, like uh, your parents, your adopted parent, adoptive parents, um, were you, did you have a loving environment and did they sort of nurture you in, in certain regards to your talents or where you wanted to go in life, your direction in life? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I would, I'm very grateful for my family, uh, 100%, you know, um, they themselves are from New York, uh, Rochester, um, and they, go, they come from, you know, pretty well-to-do families, you know, my father's father uh, was a businessman, and his grandfather was like a doctor, and my mother's side, they're like, you know, chemists and stuff like this, so they, you know, uh, very like middle class, upper middle class, and you know, education has always been very important. Um, obviously, uh, you know, they were raised uh, Christian themselves, you know, when they were younger. But um, my father, uh, my grandfather from my father's side, he attended like Unitarian Church, so that gave them a very different, you know, perspective compared to other Christians you can imagine. Uh, and my father himself and my mother, they were not, uh, um, they were agnostic, you know, like they never, uh, they were very liberal and very um, uh, kind of open-minded, you can imagine. And my father was an economic professor and all this kind of stuff. So uh, we never went to church. Uh, we didn't talk about God. Uh, we didn't uh, talk about the Bible or anything like this. So um, I was kind of free to... Um, explore and you know inquire and and you know go into uh areas that i wanted to go into um you know but we uh we really cared about accuracy i think you know about like you know if you are going to bring up a subject you know know what you're talking about uh bring evidence so it's very scientific yeah. in the way with in which that we were um and you know like it was uh my fa my grandfather from my father's side he comes from wales OK, uh, yeah. so uh, we like my father, we we have like a Welsh background. Uh, so like, you know, if you look at my family, they're like Welsh, German mix uh, predominantly. And uh, I would say they still carry that culture with them. 
you know, yeah. and they instilled that kind of um, mentality uh, with me, um, I would say, yeah. Yeah. And so you got through university and then you ended up deciding to go back to South Korea. Um, mm -hmm. So do you want to talk us a little bit through through what happened there and um, like what were you doing in university? What were you wanting to um, achieve as far as a career or vocation? I, you know, like I never really cared for school that much um, because I've always already had like, you know, 10 years of like in Korea, not really going to school. And then when I came to America, my parents really had to, you know, motivate me. And my dad did everything he could to motivate me to do. I mean, they knew I could do well if I really wanted to, you know, it's just that the problem is I have to care, you know. And so him being like an economic professor, he created like a like an algorithm that if I got a, like an A, I would get so much you know money in my uh, allowance per week, you know, and it was like exponential. <laughs> you know, yeah. if I got A's, I would get like really ridiculous amount of money per week. Yeah. And I was okay with getting like B's and, you know, B minus, you know, it was enough money for what I wanted to do, which is like, like rent video games on the weekends and play video games and stuff like this. So uh, when I went to college, uh, that was like first time being away from home. I went to Stevens Point uh, in Wisconsin and uh, uh, I kind of went nuts. Like I, you know, I, I drank uh, like almost every day. <laughs> I had a drinking problem. And uh, it uh, initially I wanted to be a psych uh, I wanted to major in psychology because, you know, I was really, you know, interested in like human psychology and, you know, I wanted to know more about myself and other people. Uh, so I took a lot of uh, uh, psych psychology credits uh, my freshman year, but they booted me out because uh, I was kind of drunk a lot, <laughs> yeah. uh, frankly. So I spent a year off uh, doing AmeriCorps, doing volunteer work in New York. Um, and that was a good, great experience. And I came back to university and uh, I, um, you know, I was doing a lot of uh, uh, sketching and uh, drawing when I was in the Adirondacks and thought, you know, I enjoyed doing this. So I thought I would go into the art department. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I thought maybe I would teach art, you know, um, and then um, all my professors were telling me that, oh, you should, you know, get PhD in art. You know, you, you know how to draw, you know how to paint. Uh, you know how to sculpt. I I uh, did sculpture as my uh, BFA, uh, you know, and I enjoyed doing that, you know. But um, uh, I wanted to like take some time off to go back to Korea just to you know learn more about my uh, past, learn more about where I come from, and why I got adopted. Um, but that just ended up becoming like not one year process. It was like a ten years of trying to search out <laughs> what was yeah. going on. So that's kind of what happened. Yeah. 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 So do you want to tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, but going back to South Korea, um, just like a thumbnail sketch there and then jump forward to, was it in, um, was it in South Korea that you started up your businesses and you had, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So initially, uh, you know, I went back and, you know, I just started teaching English because they have a demand for, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you have, you're an English major or not. It, it doesn't even matter at the time if you were an ex-convict uh, in Korea, as long as you spoke English, you know, back yeah. in uh, 2004, like they didn't care, you know, they yeah. were just hiring anybody. And uh, uh, so I, I worked at a, like, they call it Hagwon in Korea, which is like a private institute. And uh, I taught there for about a year. Um, and then, you know, I got involved with uh, the sport called Ultimate Frisbee. So a lot of my friends were uh, into this sport uh, called Ultimate Frisbee. And then, uh, you know, we were hanging out at, you know, a couple, uh, um, you know, uh, places uh, in, in Seoul that we really enjoyed. And, you know, again, uh, uh, drinking became a bit of a part of my life. Um, and I met somebody who used to be a ma manager at a bar and, you know, she had a rough history herself. Um, it's a little bit harrowing, but like, you know, basically she, you know, went through abuse with her ex-boyfriend and almost died. Uh, and, you know, we fell in love and we decided to uh, uh, start up our own business of doing uh, Mike's Cabin uh, in Korea. Um, you know, and I got a little bit of a windfall from my grandparents uh, when I was uh, at that age. And so I decided to use that money to uh, make this business. The business went well, actually, surprisingly, after now, being empty it? for, it is, uh, yeah. actually, there's a couple of them going on, but I have nothing to do with it. 
Yeah. Uh, only issue is that my relationship didn't go so well, you know, and you know, like, uh, uh, like long story short, like I was not really a, a very responsible with uh, the way I handled that business with this lady. And, um, you know, uh, I don't like to complain or blame because like, it's like I take all responsibility on myself for everything that has happened. But, uh, you know, really to uh, talk about like what happened that I was uh, basically scammed <laughs> completely, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. And if uh, for my listening audience, if you want the full details, um, Natch will um, uh, at the end of the show, will give him uh, give you his um a YouTube channel where you can find all he did a I don't know how many part series about a eight or ten part series I think yeah it goes quite in depth into your story and yeah of what happened at different stages in your life so from there from South Korea then you started traveling in was it Nepal or India um, yeah, so like I spent 10 years there, you know, like uh, teaching in English. And then, you know, I had this bar business for, I would say, about a year and a half before things really went sideways for me. She took over. I got uh, scooted out of there. Uh, and then I went back and uh, started teaching English again. I uh, found another girlfriend who was very supportive of me. And then I did like traditional Korean housing, uh, carpentry work for about a year. Um, so that was like, you know, like hard work. Uh, you know, getting like up six in the morning, working 12 hours and, and, you know, just like going to sleep. And then it was like military style, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I worked at the place that I was, uh, I was sleeping at the place I was working and we would work like 21 days in a row, wow. you know, uh, yeah. you know, and then uh, th you get like four days off and then you do like another, you know, round of 21 days in a row, yeah. <laughs> you know? That's insane. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. But I'm glad I, I, you know, I remember like, like every morning I woke up, the first thing I felt were my hands, like they were throbbing, you know, yeah. and after like you get up and then uh, you start, you know, doing stuff and then everything. But like it, it toughens you up, <laughs> you know, yeah. doing yeah. that kind of work, you know, so yeah, uh, I'm happy. I'm happy that I had that experience. I wanted to know what like, you know, quote unquote, like, you know, regular down to earth uh, Koreans and how they were living. And that was the kind of work that uh, I got, uh, you know. Um, I, I gave like it was like a like a, a lesson on like you know what a Korean style of uh you know working man's like life it was about really you know so I got yeah. that uh and they were asking me like hey you know like you can you can speak English you can teach and you can earn like double the money doing like half the work like what are you doing here and I'm like I just want to see what this was this is about I have to see it for myself yeah. you know so I got to yeah, yeah. And then so I did that. And then uh, um, uh, I ended up working uh, after that. I was like, OK, I, I really had enough, like about after about a year. Uh, then I got hired at a publishing company in like, you know, suit and tie and, you know, like you know, cubicle doing translation work and editing uh, at a, like a publishing company for like three years. They really loved me. Uh, you know, I got along with everybody and they wanted me to sign like a contract for like the rest of my life. And. And I said to myself, OK, you know, like I'm doing OK and uh, I got a little bit of money saved up and then uh, I don't really have a serious girlfriend, no marriage, no kids. Um, is this really something that I want to do for the rest of my life? Really? You know, I mean, like it was the easiest it can be, you know, I mean, yeah. like it was such uh, and, you know, uh, it was very smooth. Um, but I really didn't feel that that's something that I wanted to commit to. Uh, frankly speaking. So I just decided to liquidate everything, you know, uh, turn uh, turn everything into a backpack. Uh, and I started traveling. And then first thing I went, uh, first place I went was Japan because it's just right there next yeah. to Korea. And, uh, you know, I figured, okay, I got a little bit of money and Japan's probably going to be one of the more expensive places to go. So I might as well go there first, see how it goes, you know. And uh, when I went to Japan, uh, I was in Kyoto and, you know, like I randomly met uh, a Dutch girl who invited me to go to China. She spent a year in China learning Chinese and she like initially she was supposed to go to China to travel with her Dutch girl uh, friend, another friend. But she like backed out and she was kind of looking for somebody else. And we met, we got along and she invited me to go 
uh, to travel to China with her. And I said, sure, why not? You know, beautiful Dutch lady <laughs> who was younger yeah. than me wanted inviting me to go. And I was like, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened. Yeah. Wow. So, you, yeah, you've certainly seen some places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So Only well, compared to some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did you find um, Japanese culture? And I've heard J Japan is absolutely beautiful. Is it a very different culture to Korea? Um, it's similar. I, I would say Japan and Korea are closer to each other than Korea uh, to China, yeah. uh, as an example, or Japan to China. I mean, there's a little bit of a, a like prejudice, uh, you know, from all these countries towards each other in various ways, but more or less like Japan and Ch uh, Korea do not like China, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's like the uh, like that's something that we have in common. And then, of course, we have our uh, checkered uh, past uh, as well between Korea and Japan. I always kind of imagine like Japan to be like the older uh, stern brother of Korea. You know, yeah. and uh, and Korea is always like kind of following on the footsteps of uh, Japan, but they're very similar in many ways. Uh, I would say Japan is super clean, yeah. and like really the people are like, you know, very very honorable. You know, you can leave at that time when I was traveling. I could like leave my wallet in the uh, in the bathroom, come back like an hour later, it will be sitting there. Stupid. Nobody would yeah. touch it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Yeah. So that's yeah. the kind of culture. Uh, and you wouldn't do that. You couldn't do that in Korea. So it will be gone within like five minutes in Korea. So like yeah. I would say that that's part of the difference between Japan and Korea. Uh, yeah. And Japan's much uh, cleaner, like like even in Tokyo, like I'd never seen a, like 30 million people packed in, you know, a small area where it was like immaculate really everywhere you went, even though like I, I, I like to go to places where nobody likes to go just to see yeah. for myself and everywhere it's just equally clean yeah. you know and you can you can you can do that in korea there are places where it's like absolutely you know a dump yeah. uh, in places you know but yeah. not in not in uh, tokyo not in other osaka or other uh, other places i would just get a bicycle and i'd just like ride around just to see what's going on you know <laughs> yeah yeah wow yeah yeah i know someone that's living in japan that has been for um quite a few years and yeah and they love it over there yeah he's actually a photographer and um yeah he's got some absolutely great photos yeah so so you go to china so do you want to talk us through a little bit about that next part of your journey yeah um so you know like uh, this lady, um, you know, she she had to go to Indonesia. I went to Mongolia. I was traveling in Mongolia a little bit. And then we met up in uh, uh, near Shanghai, uh, China. She flew up. I flew down. And then uh, we began our journey. We took a, a train from this uh, uh, like Shanghai area uh, to um, I think it was like Xining, but there's a Guming. It's like really like a southern uh, part of China. It's like a it was like a, a almost like a day, uh, like maybe it was like 24 hour train ride. I don't remember. We slept uh, in the train and then we began our journey. And she was interested in going to, excuse me, like um, Tibetan parts of uh, China. So, you know, when China took over Tibet, uh, Tibet used to be much larger and like half of it got um, broken up and it got added to like Sichuan and Yunnan. And so they're still. Tibet, but they're part of official China, right? Yeah. So you could you can travel to those Tibetan regions using Chinese visa because it's part of China now. Yeah. Right. And uh, so that's basically what we did. We went to we took a lot of buses and vans and just went to like villages uh, to go and see like what like Tibet was in the Chinese side. And we stayed with like in the monasteries and guest houses and you know just trying to. Um, you know, like, I don't know, we both had this kind of fascination for this kind of uh, type of traveling, you know, um, that's something that we had in common. So two months we spent um, traveling like this, you know, just taking buses and trekking and, you know, taking buses. And uh, we, uh, she got another scholarship to go to Beijing. Um, you know, this was uh, 2014, uh, I think, like April, no, uh, it was already after May. So it was like, uh, uh, basically May, June until July, we were traveling. So for a couple months, we were traveling together. 
she uh, went back to uh, uh, Netherlands to visit her mother. And then she had to go back to Beijing to start school like in September or something like this. And, you know, we talked about like potentially staying together, but I didn't really want to like live in Beijing. I didn't know what I would do there. I just wanted to continue traveling. So I went to Tibet um, and then from Tibet, uh, because you have to have like a special permit and you have to have a guide with you to go to Tibet. And, you know, we had like a I had like a nine day, um, you know, uh, travel through Tibet. So it's like Lhasa and bus rides and like, you know, uh, Everest and other places. And they spat me out to uh, Nepal. I never actually knew where Nepal was until I got there. I was like, oh, okay, this is where Nepal is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so were you going into the temples? Were, was this where you started doing meditational practices or had you already been doing meditation prior to um, this sort of part of your life? Because I know you said when I, you were I, growing up, you were well, your parents were agnostic, so um, you yeah. pretty much were left, you know, to your own devices as to find where you wanted to go on a spiritual or religious um, level. So, when did your sort of spiritual journey begin? Uh, I would say, I mean, like you know, you can argue that you know we are all on a spiritual journey, yeah. <laughs> right? Like uh, yeah. from the from the birth yeah. uh, from yeah, birth, but exactly. like exactly, but I, mean, I don't con really consciously, yeah. What I mean yeah, is yeah, your yeah. conscious um, decision to go, okay, I'm going to really look within now and ask the big questions and things. I didn't know what meditation, I thought I knew what meditation was. Like, so I had like a little bit of a, a practice and I, you know, when I was in Korea, uh, like when I was in university, I was already interested in like spirituality and the form of spirituality that I was like going into at the time when I was at university was like, you know, uh, uh, talking with God, you know, there's like a, a, a series of books called like uh, uh, Talking with God or something like this. Oh, it's like yeah, there's three part series. Yeah. Conversations with God. Conversations with God. Yeah. yeah. So Neil I was Donald like Walsh. really into that. Yeah. Yeah. I was really into that at that time. And then uh, I got uh, I, I used to go to like, you know, use bookstores a lot. So I found uh, uh, Bhagwan Shuri Rajneesh, whom we know as Osho. So I read like, like, like I was constantly reading uh, Bhagwan Shuri Rajneesh when I was in university, you know, just like I would go to used bookstores, just look for his books and just buy them for a couple bucks. And then uh, I'll be like reading. So I was very familiar with this stuff. And and, you know, I, and I was really intrigued by uh, his material at that time, yeah. you know, and I got involved with like a little bit of meditation here, here and there because like I was part of. You know, I, I, I mean, I played chess. I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, playing sports when I was in university. But I like my uh, uh, a philosophy professor, she was running like once a week uh, meditation rooms, you know. And so we would like, uh, you know, like a couple other professors and myself and a few other people who were interested in Buddhism would get together and do meditations for an hour. But um, in in actuality, I feel that I really didn't know meditation until I started doing Vipassana, which is yes. uh, when I got to Nepal. And then uh, uh, after I got to Nepal, I met some kind of yogi type people, you know, and and, you know, like it was really uh, a bittersweet journey of meeting phony people, <laughs> what it came down to, you know, because, you know, you're a Westerner and you're respectful of everybody's culture and they dress the part. Um, but they were like, you know, scammers a little bit, you know, like yeah. really what it came down to, you know, and they were like extracting money from you. And yeah. I was giving them, you know, because I wanted to know, you know, and I, I got to know like, you know, there are uh, these Hindu must go places. And one of them is called Pashbati Nath, uh in Nepal. There's two places in Nepal, three places uh, between India and Nepal for like Hindu uh, like pilgrimages, they must go. And, uh, you know, like one is Pashupati Nath. I met the president of uh, Pashupati Nath, you know, and he's a complete scoundrel. I will, I will say that openly, you know, like, uh, and he, his past is like, like really not, uh, not to be like talked about too much because it's like really not that good, you yeah. know, but it's the kind of people who are involved in this kind of, you know, they, 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 you know, wear all everything and they speak very nicely and stuff like this, but their practice is, uh, you know, their behavior is not matching the philosophy, okay, yeah. what it comes yeah. out to. And then, you know, you meet a lot of people like this and then you see the pattern of people like that who just, they have, they play the part, 
but they don't actually live it. You know, that's yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah, so they don't and, want uh, to talk. Yeah, 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 in my opinion. That's my opinion, okay? Yeah. And so uh, I uh, became very frustrated frustrated with all that kind of experience and then somebody su suggested like uh you know I, I you know there's Osho center there uh in Nepal and India I went to and hung out in the Osho center and it's a cult you know like later on I kind of started to realize that it's like it, you know they they wanted me to like become initiate and I was like I'm not ready to become an initiate you know and they're like okay you know like uh, you can wear this mala with like Osho's uh you know uh uh, picture on it and then you know you can do chantings and stuff like that and I just want to I can't I have to have my own experience it's important yeah so I yeah. go I have my experience some of the meditation stuff is good they have you know what's called like dynamic meditation where you go crazy you know you jump around and you move around and you scream you know you can get all that frustration out and stuff like this but yeah. it wasn't really meditation in in my opinion you know yeah. only when I went to Vipassana did I realize that this was like like you know, and it's it's hard. That's yes. the thing, you know, because meditation is not meant to be easy, you know? Yes, yes. I, yeah. he I heard of Vipassana all oh, 25 or so years ago, I think. A friend of mine went to a retreat, um, a Vipassana retreat up Sunshine Coast. And I remember her telling me how hard it was. I think it's nine days or 12 days or something and it's silent 10 days it's 10 days it's 10, yeah. 10 days That's yeah. Like, yeah and it's complete silence and she said um you just have to focus it like the first section she learned was just focusing on the breath and just the sensation yeah. of the breath coming out of the nose in this area and you you just really get into feeling the body um it's yeah. it's not about trying to switch off the mind or or well i guess to a point you're trying to clear the mind but it's really being present and mm -hmm. and really feeling into the body and the sensations of the body was the best way she described it to me but um she managed to do it i think it took her a couple of goes to actually do mm -hmm. the full course but she ended up doing it, but she wanted to know if I wanted to. And at the time I was like, I really don't, I was totally honest. I said, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could shut my mouth for 10 days. <laughs> I'd have to yeah. speak, you know, like that would have been real at that time. I think I'd be a little, it'll be a bit easier now, I think for me. Um, but yeah. So do you want to speak a little bit about the Vipassana um, practice and yeah. And what you got out of it yeah i mean it's uh it, it's not meant to be easy so it's not like you go and retreat and like hang out and do whatever you want it's actually you know very strict right yeah. you like i know the schedule like the back of my hand i've done a lot of courses i volunteered uh and became like you know assistant teacher for uh a lot of the courses so too so i was very much gung ho uh at that time you know because the first time i wanted to go they rejected me and they like because i was smoking a little bit and I was honest about it. I was telling them like, yeah, I, I was smoking till yesterday. And they're like, no, you got to you got to not do anything for a month. No drinking, no tobacco, no, no, nothing. You know, yeah. like you got to keep clean for a month. And so I was like, all right, fine. And uh, so they rejected me. And then uh, during that time, I was actually, OK, you know, I'm going to do the bare minimum one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon or in the evening. And I'm going to be really like you know strict with myself and then and then when i'm allowed to go i'm gonna go like hardcore you know like so you get up at four in the morning i got up at like three like 50 in the morning and then you know uh like washed up used the bathroom and then i'm waiting for the guy to hit that bell so i can be the first one you know in there and i can be the last one in there but like uh the thing about the breathing is called anapana uh so uh, it's it's very different from pranayama. I practiced uh, pranayama before, but that's rhythmic breathing, right? So you can like breathe in, you hold the breath, or you can like do kind of Wim Hof type of thing. You know, that's also a part of like pranayama. But this is just like you just breathe, and then every time you breathe, you just try to concentrate on the sensation here, yeah. right? Every time you're breathing in, every time you're breathing out, you're just trying to develop. So three days. Three and a half days, actually. It's like 30% uh, of it. It's like uh, you just try to focus. You know, I'm trying to look at myself right here, you yeah. know, and where. Uh, uh, so you're just trying to develop concentration at that point. OK, but during that time, you know, you're doing. Uh, so the schedule is, uh, you know, 430 to 630 is meditation, right? 630 uh, till eight is breakfast. 
Okay, so hour and a half, you got breakfast, a little bit of uh, rest. Eight to 11 is uh, meditation, three hours. 11 to one is lunch and rest. One to five is meditation, four hours, right? And then uh, five to six, there's no dinner. Uh, there's just tea, uh, you know, and then like the new students maybe get some crackers or something like this, but there's no food. Yeah. Okay, so it's just rest. And there's no usually speaking. and six. No speaking. No, it's called, yeah, no, no talking whatsoever. They suggest you that you don't even make eye contact with anybody. Uh, don't just pretend like nobody's there. They call it Arya Mauna. Mauna means silence. Arya is noble. So the, it's a noble silence, right? And uh, you're supposed to uh, be strict about uh, your practice. You know, the, the foundation is called Shila. Shila is morality. So they ask you, you know, uh, uh, no indecent sexual act in whatever form, right? You know, no killing, you know, no stealing, you know, um, no drinking or doing any drugs, you know. So it's like you're, you're a monk yeah. for that 10 days, yeah. right? No writing, no reading, no computers, no phone, no internet, no talking, nothing, right? Yeah. So 6 to 7.30 is meditation. And then 7.30 to 9, they have what is called satsang. Satsang just means like to sit near, but it's like a kind of a lecture. And then 9 to 9.30 is meditation. So it comes out to like 11 to 11 and a half hours of meditation per day, right? Yeah. Every day. And then you go to sleep and then you do it all over again for 10 days in a row. Yeah. But the problem is, is that, you know, our mind wanders, you know, quite a bit all the time. We're, we're easily distracted. They say the mind is like a monkey that is drunk, that is uh, stung by a scorpion. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's basically, you know, your mind. And uh, the idea is to purify yourself because the actual Vipassana part, because the Anapana is actually just to cultivate concentration. That's the only thing that it's supposed to do. After you cultivated concentration, you're supposed to move that concentration all throughout your body so that you can pick up on sensation um, and you don't make any judgments about it because you're, you're supposed to be equal. It, you're trying to achieve equanimity, which means that you're not trying to run away from uh, any kind of displeasure, but you're not running towards any pleasure. You're just trying to maintain equanimity and uh, uh, like this uh, uh, scanning, basically it's kind of scanning that you end up doing is supposed to purify you and it does purify you. I don't know how the alchemical process is, but somehow it, uh, because like all these memories in your body though yeah. too, and then when you become aware of it, it just kind of evaporates it somehow. I yes. don't know, yeah. you know, but it works. Yes, because I'm currently studying soul-centered healing hypnosis and um mm -hmm we get our clients to scan the body um, after we've taken them down into the uh, theta brainwave state we get them to scan the body and um it's amazing you know the the stuck emotions literally you know cause pains and aches and blockages and and blockages in the um the chakras and the meridians and things like that as well so yeah it's it's very palpable you know what emotions can do and and thoughts like negative thought forms can do to the to the body to the physical and the um the other the energetic bodies as well so did you have any um uh like sort of supernatural type experiences through the meditation process like did did you get any um insight into you know connecting with source or did you see or visualize anything or was it more just really just sticking with the the body and the sensations of the body and also um, how how did you work through the letting go of the monkey mind thoughts <laughs> Well, it's it's a constant battle, uh, you know, of like, like, there's no letting go. Maybe there are moments, at least for me, some uh, stillness here and there. But um, like, you know, every uh, like total amount of Vipassana I probably did is about like 15 or 16. You know, like it's uh, uh, I was doing like one, like one, twice, thrice, uh, like every year, you know, since uh, 2015. Yeah. But, um, you know, my my um, first experience was quite intense because I was like really, you know, like like adamant about it. And I was just going to do the best that I could. And um, 
after like day five or six, because like initially I had so much heat coming out of my body. Like I was like burning up and, and that was associated with a lot of like negativity that I was holding within myself. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these like, uh, frustrations that I was like experiencing with people and, you know, failed experiences, whatever, you know, like you, you get into that victim mentality and you start to put blame on people, but the Vipassana, uh, the, you know, what they do is that, you know, uh, initially what people want to do is they'd like to blame the other and put hundred percent responsibility on the other and say, okay, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. And then over time, you know, the idea of Vipassana is to kind of make it 50, 50, you know, yeah. like, okay, let's, let's meet halfway. Yeah. But then over time, you take 100% of that responsibility on you. You are in control. Okay, you messed up, but you're in control. You know, you're in control. And that way, from that moment on, uh, once you cultivated this like responsibility for yourself, all your experiences become your responsibility. Yeah, it's a bit More like Ho'oponopono. Yeah. Have you heard of Ho'oponopono? No. I'm oh, not sure what that is. I think it's a Japanese, I uh, could be wrong, don't quote me. Um, it's a practice where you take full responsibility. So whatever the situation mm -hmm. is or whatever you're feeling about a certain situation, uh, whether it's something within yourself or um, something that has happened between you and another person, there's no blame. But what you do is you just re recite um, uh, the mantra. Um, I think it starts with... Um, I'm sorry, um, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. And so whatever mm. the situation is, you just keep saying that, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you. And even if you don't see that you've done anything wrong in that situation, just the mere fact of you saying that you are sorry means that you're taking responsibility for your part in that interaction. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, uh, look it up at some stage. Yeah, it's called Ho Ho'opono Pono. Okay. I'll, I'll send you a link to some. Yeah, I'll, I'll write that down to remind me to send you a link to one of the, yeah, the, there's heaps of YouTube um, yeah. uh, videos on it. Yeah. So sorry I got you off, off track there a little bit. But, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, the, you know, just like my initial experience, because every Vipassana experience is a little bit different. Yeah. So I'm not going to go through all the different experiences that I've had, but the initial one was quite profound for me, though, too, because yeah. uh, what Vipassana does is that it purifies you and, and you like achieve a level of sensitivity that you never thought that you could achieve. I could feel electrical impulses like going down my arm and like stomach and like, you know, like, uh, you know, like every time you move your muscle, you're like sending signals and stuff. I could feel that, you yeah. know, I could feel my stomach like moving and digesting and, you know, like I just couldn't believe all these sensations that I never felt before, but yeah. I could feel, you know, uh, so I wouldn't consider these to be like supernatural or superpowers or anything like this. It's just that we all have the capability to uh, like, like get to that level because like, it's like watching a black and white TV all your life. And never realizing that you can just like flick on a switch and then it turns turns into like uh, HD, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's kind of like that, you know, yeah. where you're hearing and you're seeing like, like one, when you're out of Vipassana for like doing 10 days of hardcore, like meditation, eating like sattvic food, like, you know, no meat and no alcohol, you, you're like basically cleansing yourself and you walk out, you hear all the birds and all the noises, you hear everything. It's like, it becomes like 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 almost too much and for a couple of days for me that you're still in that mode of vipassana like of like this hyper awareness yeah and like seeing like like colors that like you would normally not see you know like uh in detail yes. and then it, you start to kind of equalize you know <laughs> uh uh after after a few days and and get back to, into reality otherwise it's like too much you know yes it's yeah. very intense yeah so you you've raised your vibration um, obviously to a, a higher level that you, you know, you bring in that super or hyper sensitivity to things that previously yeah. are unseen or unfelt because we do tend to numb um, our senses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like all our senses, you know, not just the physical senses, but um, 
yeah so i guess this is a way of unlocking those those latent um you know senses and things that we've all got um access to yeah, yeah. I, I mean those uh, there's a reason why we do that because like you know it's like being callous because like being overly sensitive um prevents you from being able to operate in a regular society mm. you know what i mean because you are you become overly sensitive about everything you know every noise every you know like if there's if you're living in a city you know i've lived in a city before there's like car noises at like midnight you know like yeah. uh, all the time some silent silent is going off somebody is getting chased you know something's happening you know all yeah. the time and you got to drown that out otherwise you can't sleep you can't function you yeah. know exactly yeah so moving on from the Vipassana, unless there was anything else you wanted to speak about that, but um, I'm eager to hear about your motorbike trekking. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, um, I like basically my experience in uh, Nepal, I experienced like uh, the earthquake of 2015, which was like a pretty major one. I was trying to, you know, operate like a guest house type of situation. Everything failed. Uh, like I'm just a horrible businessman, you know, I just don't know how to, uh, uh, do anything. And, uh, you know, I was trying to export coffee out of Nepal for about a year, uh, working with a company there. And, uh, that also didn't go so well. I learned a lot about coffee. I learned a lot about the coffee business in Nepal, got to sit on the board with like other coffee producers there. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting experience, but, uh, it wasn't really, uh, financially, you know, great and i was just like okay like i'm i'm not really cut up for uh doing business uh so again i got rid of everything because i i i was spending a lot of time like you know making furniture i made tables and beds and uh chairs for the guest house you know so i was doing a lot of carpentry work that i was you know i i, I had the skills from doing you know korean carpentry right so um uh, i just got rid of everything again and turned it into a backpack bought a motorcycle in delhi and just just decided okay screw it because i bought like an old old like royal enfield like yeah. that was like from made in like 1984 that you had to like kickstart yeah. and that was like first real motorcycle that i uh uh was learning on but it was yeah. like really constant maintenance like that bike was like really uh, uh you know i was spending more money for it than the bike was worth yeah. what it came down to so i just like okay this is I, I, it was fun it was really fun to ride this like heavy you know old you know like almost like world war ii style motorcycle yeah. you know yeah. around and it was so yeah. loud too you know yeah <laughs> yeah i can't imagine kickstarting i've got a ducati and um there's no way i'd be wanting to kickstart <laughs> yeah and when i was listening to um your shows on uh, when you were talking about your motorcycle treks and i think i made a couple of comments actually on on it and um yeah just the terrain and the things that you had to go through and and here i am complaining about a few potholes around here after we've had some rain <laughs> and there's no way i'd be taking my bike to places where you went you were so brave <laughs> well it's you know in nepal uh i took this old motorcycle with a, a friend of mine and we took it into the mountains to, to like you know into one of the mountains there and um it's like a three hour drive like you know and then like like basically about 80 percent of the way my bike just completely broke down yeah, and wow. we spent like almost like half of the day just like pushing it like uphill together you know yeah. and then riding it downhill pushing it uphill together riding it downhill <laughs> for hours oh my you know God. and yeah. uh you know and it was like the biggest workout because like you know you're you're pushing this bike yeah oh my gosh and you know like like the bike is like like 180 kgs you know yeah. and stuff like this it was yeah. just a nightmare and yeah. so that was a good experience uh at that time uh so you know we i had like two experiences kind of like that the first one was definitely like like really you know crazy and then second one was like maybe half that but there's still like many hours of pushing and like riding uh from a place where you're not going to get a truck or anything and anyway yeah. you know so uh, when i decided to do the motorcycle i bought like a uh like a brand new himalayan with boxes and stuff like that i spent a little bit of money and i just like okay like i want to make sure everything's working 
it's not kickstarting. It's more like, you know, um, a little bit more modern, up to date. Uh, so I drove it from Delhi to like Kathmandu, which is like, you know, eight hours, nine hours per day drive, uh, you know, like, and then, you know, sleeping wherever you can and then uh, riding again for eight, nine hours and then sleeping wherever you can and you cross the border. And then from uh, Nepal, I went to Shikim, which is like you have to drive all the way across Nepal to the eastern border. And then I went up to Shikim and I spent like two months in Shikim where I was doing Vipassana for about a month. So like like the first Vipassana, I was uh, actually they needed a. Uh, uh, somebody to, you know, serve. So I volunteered to serve. Uh, so I served for 12 days, you know, 10 days. It's like, you know, and then uh, three days rest. And then I went into another Vipassana like right away. So it was like, you know, 24 days straight of Vipassana. And then I was driving around to different places. Uh, and then uh, I went to like this place called Yok Yoksam, which is like a small little village. And then you can go to uh, this mountain called Mount Kanchenjenga, which is actually the third largest uh, mountain in the world, uh, but it's a holy mountain. It's it borders right between Nepal and uh, uh, India, but nobody can climb it. Nobody can go and uh, go to the top because nobody's allowed to. And um, you know, I went to a monastery before I went to uh, this mountain, and I met a monk. I met the head monk there. So this is another little crazy side story. I got like a like a ton of oh, stories. I like you I, write I can, a book. You should write a book. <laughs> Maybe someday I will. Uh, yeah. I, I I think uh, uh, you know I'm still on my journey, though. I yeah. I feel you know maybe maybe it could be multiple perks. I'm yeah, not sure. Maybe you could write a trilogy or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But Sorry, uh, this monk your... guy. Yep. This monk guy. Uh, he, they're calling him the captain of uh, this. Uh, Han Mian Cheng is the name of the monastery. You know and. Mm -hmm. And again, I was like doing uh, like I love going to monasteries. I have a, like a strong connection to like Tibetan. I don't know, um, uh, like a culture. Uh, I just feel like it's part of my past life. And actually, I, I have a story that actually confirms this. But, um, you know, so what I would do, I like to go there in the morning. So like during the morning time, uh, the monks, they all gather and they do chanting, you know, like between uh, breakfast and lunch. They go in there and they chant for a couple hours. You know, they do ring, like like playing music and they do their chanting. And it's a very good time, you know, just go sit there, listen to their chanting and sit there and do my meditation. And I like to do meditation for like an hour, hour and a half. It's not a problem for me. And uh, after they were done, uh, one of the monks noticed that I was sitting there just meditating. And I wanted to just sit there in the silence in the hall in the monastery and he asked me like hey excuse me and he spoke like very clear english and he asked me like if i wanted to have lunch with him and i was like sure why not he's inviting me i thought he was just one of the monks but he was the head monk there this head monk has a very interesting story because uh he used to be the bodyguard of the last king of shikkim okay so the shikkim was a kingdom uh, yeah. all the way up to like 1978, 1975 or something like this. And there used to be a king. And this monk used to be like a bodyguard of this king. This guy, he, this monk, his father was like a yogi who was like meditating in the mountains. His grandfather was another yogi who was also meditating in the mountains. And uh, the, the way he was born, this is a very funny story because like I, you know, uh, so his father was like a hardcore yogi. He was like going into a cave and he was just spending his time. And he, you know, and when you are meditating like this, you like gather like attractive attraction, like people like are curious about you. Like, who is this guy? Yeah. And so he had to go. He had to go from one cave to another, like further and further away from people. So he would be like completely isolated. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually people were leaving him alone. Now, his mother was a very young, beautiful lady from a, one of the most rich families in that area, okay, in Shikim. And she, you know, they were practicing this kind of arranged marriages, and she was she was supposed to read another rich person, you know, for like, you know, family, stuff like this. And she didn't want to. She was not in love. She was not ready. So she ran away. <laughs> she ran yeah. away from her family. And, and, you know, like everybody and everybody's like searching for her. So she ran away to like this guy's cave and ended up being with him. And, you know, they ended up uh, uh, being together and he was the result, you know? So yeah. like it, she was like ruined 
for this marriage, but it saved her from that marriage though too at the same time. Yeah. So this captain, when he was five years old, his father brought him to a monastery and said, okay, this is going to be your home from now on. So from five, at the age of five, he became a monk, you know? He was born to be a monk. He was yeah. born to be a monk. Yeah. yeah. So he he has the record in Sikkim area for being the youngest monk to memorize like three volumes of sutras. Like there's like a, you know, uh, it doesn't matter about age because as, you, as long as you memorize the sutras, you go to the next level. Mm -hmm. So at the age of 11, he already accomplished like the memorization of the sutras that other monks would normally take, you know, in their teenage years or you know, even in their 20s, this is like, you know, university level stuff. So he he was already able to do, to do that. He uh, went into university and uh, learned about security and stuff like this. So he ended up becoming the right hand man of the last king of Shikim. So that's kind of his life story. So I got yeah. to meet this guy. I got to hang out with him. He was like really wanting me to like hang out with him and live with him. And I told him I got to go and drive more, you know, I got to go to other places. So that that that's my story with him. But there are other stories like that, you know. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely should write a book, I tell you. <laughs> so so what year was that when you were coming to the to the end of your motorcycle trekking? That was about what, 20? 16, it, it? it was the beginning of 2018 january of 2018 i began and then i went to shikim and then i went to muktinat uh from shikim uh you know like which is in uh, nepal in the yeah. in the anapuna area where i had my uh breakthrough uh dmt experience right and muktinat is the second uh holy place that's where they believe that in in um in hindu in hinduism so pashvatinat is one of the places and muktinat is the other place where vishnu the you know the god of sustainer god yep. right brahma vishnu shiva yep. uh, vishnu came down on garoda like this bird you know and and he came down on uh from the mountain muktinat mukti means to liberate right so yep. muktinat is the village of liberation yeah it's like 3700 meters above sea level but people make uh, pilgrimages from like all over the world there is uh, a holy place yeah and so you would you just mentioned a couple of seconds ago about your um experience like um uh with was it dmt or ayahuasca yeah yeah do you want to No, uh, ayahuasca is later but this is uh uh crystal dmt uh yeah. that uh so uh, this is another really strange part of the story where uh like when i was running a guest house i ended up working with a, a girl from kazakhstan and a guy from russia there were a couple and you know our relationship didn't really work out very well uh, she ended up breaking up and she went to muktinad and she ended up being with another guy from ukraine and they uh, made you know they were working at this guest house i went to visit her she uh, was very friendly towards me and uh, she was uh, inviting me to stay with them and all this kind of stuff. So I, you know, uh, so I got to see her again after like a year or so, like not seeing each other. And after like, you know, things didn't go really very uh, well. And uh, she introduced me to a Russian guy who was like kind of a, like a shaman, you know, and he was carrying around all this like paraphernalia and such. And, um, you know, I was I've had a lot of mushroom and LSD experiences in the past, you know starting in like high school, essentially, you know, I was always interested in this kind of like, I don't know, psychedelic stuff. But uh, he, you know, I, I heard about ayahuasca and I told him like, I would love to have an ayahuasca experience. So, um, you know, he, he was asking me if I had ever tripped before. And I was like, yeah, like over a hundred times, you know? So we set it up like, uh, like, so in the yoga, in the yoga room at midnight uh, in Muktinath, uh, we closed all the like, uh, you know, curtains and, um, you know, everybody was asleep and uh, I, you know, smoked a, a DMT through a pipe, uh, a crystal DMT. And uh, I had like a breakthrough experience because I've never smoked DMT and it was like a massive like quantity though, too, because like if I knew what it was, I would not have taken that much. <laughs> I don't yeah. think so, because I would be too scared. <laughs> Because yeah. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought it was just going to be like, whoa, like every other experience. It wasn't like that at all. It, I saw like a spiral, you know, descending and I went into a portal. And once I went into a portal, I was like in free fall mode. 
you know, like I was like twisting and turning and like falling into a kaleidoscope. I mean, I remember the whole experience. Like if I can just recall every bit of it. And that's the really funny part about it because most people don't remember their uh, breakthrough DMT experiences. But I was meditating every day, like two hours a day, three hours a day, like, you know, like religiously yeah. every day. So like I had a, like a high level of concentration. Yes. You know, yeah. that actually helped me to remember uh, everything yeah. that happened. So, you know, long story short that, you know, I I, I met a, you know, like a, a monk entity, you know, and then he was like showing me like some pyramid stuff. And I was just like, I don't know, I'm ready for this. And they're like, okay, get out of here. And then, you know, everything was like, like flipping in. They were like uh, flickering inside out. Like I was like flickering from this world to the, the, uh, the other world back and forth. Yeah. So it was a pretty, pretty deep trip for sure. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, I haven't had any psychedelics. Um, yeah, I think um, probably marijuana is the only thing that I've ever really um, dabbled in, and I, it didn't really agree with me. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, yeah. So, um, so that brings us up to about twenty eighteen. So, when did yeah. you? Yeah. So, when did you first start to realize that the actual world isn't what, um, you know, we would brought up thinking it was like when was your actually awakening to you know what's sort of going on in the world now and all the deception of you know every sector of of life like when did you sort of stumble yeah for me that? it was probably like 2004 uh when i like i finished university at the end of 2003 yeah but the the september event for me was kind of like a big question mark because it didn't really like register but i accepted you know whatever uh, version that they have uh, told me i was like 21 22 at the time or whatever uh when it yeah. happened so i was just like okay like you know some crazy people whatever you know like but it it doesn't look right something was off but i didn't know how to articulate it and i didn't really give enough care for it you know at the time but once i was done with school uh, at the end of 2003, and then in 2000 and early 2004, I had, um, you know, I, I, I you know, uh, uh, came back to Korea, and then I was like doing my own research at the time, you know, like, so at that time, I was really like looking into the September event uh, as a like, you know, uh, psyop, I, I can't use that word, but it's a kind of like, a, you know, you know, it's like a, some kind of operation. Yeah. right uh yeah. not what they uh, uh have told us and then i i found this documentary called the money masters uh, by bill still or bill stills and uh, that also like woke me up to how money system work, uh, was working because i thought i had a good idea how how politics work worked you know i thought i had a good idea how economics worked my dad was an economic professor i read some of the books that he was teaching at university or at college because I was actually interested in, and he was recommending like, you know, this is how eco economics works. And these are the people, you know, uh, uh, John Adams and stuff like this. And, and I was like, oh, okay, this is the history, but in reality, it's not like that at all. And then, so I started to go into the rabbit hole. Um, I would say like in 2004 and incrementally, I it, it led me to some crazy directions. Yeah. Where I'm like, okay, I I lost, uh, you know, a couple of years uh, going down that rabbit hole. But yep. you know, we have to get lost sometimes to find our way here exactly. and there, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's it also helps us to develop discernment as well because yeah, it it really teaches you to have to sort the wheat from the chaff and um yeah, and the fact that there is such a thing as um, controlled opposition when it comes to mm -hmm. you know seeking truth and things like that. So yeah. Um, so the flat earth and the Mandela effect sort of started, um, hitting the waves, so to speak in around 2014, 2015, 2016, depending on who you talk to. So did you, um, like, when did you sort of come across that? Um, was that sort of part of the progression of your going down different rabbit holes and, um, or did you just stumble across it? Yeah, like uh, um, I I I felt 
you know, when I left Korea, I was already well versed in quote unquote conspiracies, you know, like yeah. a little bit arrogant. I, like when I was like traveling, I carried a, a, a big book called Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. And, you know, that's what I was reading. That was my Bible when I was like, like traveling, like it's like a big book. And that, you know, like <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, 1500 pages. And that's what what I was. It's, so it's like all about history, all about different stuff in there. And I thought, OK, I know conspiracies pretty well. But then uh in 2014 you know i was trying to do the guest house thing and you know i was kind of like getting involved and i saw uh a youtube video uh about like obama giving a speech about like oh we don't have time to you know meet with a flat earth society you know like like and i really was like why are you, why is he like mentioning the flat earth at all like like for what like it's so ridiculous you know to even talk about it right and uh, I remember because like when I used to have the bar, I had to take over from another business, which was like a board game cafe. And there used to be a game called Illuminati card game. And I kept a couple versions of that. And I, you know, was reading through it. And I remember one card that was, uh, you know, the flat earthers know something like this. So I was like, OK, this is so stupid. I can just like, you know, spend like, you know, maybe 10 minutes going through you know, the internet and start looking for some information to debunk this, you know? And then, so I found, uh, uh, there's a guy by the name of uh, Matt Powerland or Matt Powerland, yes. okay? Uh, 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 he, like he used to work for NASA and then he's telling his testimony about like how everybody's like laughing at the public, you know, and uh, you know, and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, maybe this guy is just like, you know, eccentric uh, artist type, you know, he's an artist. And then I found Eric Dubay also you know and he was talking about it and then later on i found uh, mark Sargent with his uh, 10 uh clues you know like flat earth clues yeah so those were the uh, but eric dubay initially was the my main influencer because he suggested uh everybody to go and read some books by this guy by the name of robotham who lived like 100 years ago prior to the 1900s who wrote like earth not a globe parallax you know uh uh you know stuff like this Right. And then so I, I actually went and read those books and then became a flat earther after a couple months. Yeah. yeah. So that was back in the summer, fall of 2014 uh, when I was in Nepal. I can remember it, you know, the yeah. whole process. And yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that was a well early to the party, I guess, because that's when it first really, I think it was 2014 when it really sort of came to, you know, the um, collective consciousness, I guess, in, in a big way. I actually stumbled across it. I think it was in early, it was either late 15 or early, I think it was early 16, actually. But how did mm. your peers and people that you were um, in contact with at that time, how did they react to it? Did they think you were crazy? Did they want to know more about it? Or ha ha what was the response from people when you were talking about it? Or did you not talk about it? <laughs> um, I didn't really talk about it too much because, like, I was still, like, like I felt 100% like, you know, convinced that the earth was flat and we we're in stationary and every uh, evidence was leading me in that direction. Um, you know, but like I had a, well, excuse me, like, a, uh, but like, so my uh, girlfriend at the time, my girlfriend uh, at the time from Russia, like uh, back, we were together in 2016 to 2017. So I used to have a Facebook account and I used to like, you know, uh, write stuff about the flat earth and got a lot of uh, uh, kickback from the public, of course. And then I was just like, okay, this is a waste of time. And then I was trying to convince my girlfriend for a while from Russia that the earth is flat, but she was really not happy with me that I was trying to convince her. You know, so it was a, a difficult process. Um, I didn't really get involved with the community of like flat earthers, you know, and I didn't really go to like channels and like hang out in the chat. Uh, that only really happened like end of 2018 after my motorcycle trek that I started to get involved more with like the truth community, you know? Yeah. 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 So, um, and the ME, the, the Mandela effect, um, which I'll explain to people that don't know is um, a phenomena that we don't actually know when it started or it could have been going on for eons, but it's like mm. when things sort of incrementally change or retroactively change from what we remember. Mm. And a lot of people think it's memories that we're misremembering and things like that, but there's so much evidence now 
and so much proof and so much uh, residual, um, you know, residual evidence that it's it's not just a memory thing. It's not just um, people like businesses and corporations changing logos and things like that. Um, it, it goes across all different things. It goes across pop culture, um, you know, the entertainment industry into the um, geography, uh, the biology of the body, um, all sorts of things. So, um, yeah. yeah, so we can talk about a few of the Mandela effects for people that don't know about it. But when did you come across that? Was that just around the same time as the Flat Earth or a little bit after? No, no. It was after my motorcycle trek. And then I, uh, you know, I settled into this hut that I'm in, uh, which was a end of uh, um, towards the end of 2018. It was uh, like basically end of September. Uh October ish. And then I was just like, you know, uh, browsing through uh, YouTube. And there was a suggestion on like, I don't know, like uh, Mojo some channel, uh, you know, and they, they talked about like top five Mandela effect. Uh, and then I just like looked through it. And I was just like, okay, this is kind of weird, you know, and if, so it was based based on a YouTube suggestion. And I was just curious about that. Yeah, I do kind of remember about some of these changes. And then I start to go and find other uh, channels that who were talking about it. And one channel that really brought me over was a, a channel that is called Harbinger, uh, uh, Harbin Harbinger of Harvest is the name of the channel. And he had a video called that um, he believes that 99.9% .9 chance that Mandela effect is real or something like that. And basically he was talking about the lion and the lamb yeah. and the wine skins. And not that I'm a big Bible guy, but I remember about the lion lion and the lamb mm. and i remember the wine skins because i did i really enjoyed the parables by uh, jesus you know i didn't care about like the old testament so much but yeah. the you know all these like you know uh sermon on the rock and you know all these other like you know allegories and parables i really enjoyed those type of stories and i remember the wine skins you know and it was supposed to be like a you know like like kind of culture and old ways, you know, like new wine and new wine skins and old wine and old wine skins. So there's a difference between old wine skins and new wine skins, but there's no no longer any wine skins. It's just wine bottles. Yeah. And then it actually changed because I, I carry a, a Geneva Bible uh, with me when I was even motorcycling uh, around. And uh, I look through those areas, you know, Isaiah 11, 6, you know, Mark 2, 22, and uh, uh, they've changed. Yeah. And then they changed again in Mark 2, 22 from wine, uh, wine bottles. I remember wine bottles around that time. And now it's like wine vessels yeah. now. So it has changed again. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to keep up with them. So what was the first few big ones that you um, sort of thought, oh, yeah, wow, I remember it a certain way. Like what, what are the, the first, you know, say two or three that really stuck out to you initially when you first started researching it? Yeah, it's difficult to uh, like categorize them because there, there, there is a lot. Actually, there is a lot, but uh, um, you know, like life is a box. Bo life is a box of chocolates. Uh, life was a box of chocolates. That change, you know. Yeah. Uh, Ed McMahon has got to be one of the biggest ones uh, for sure. Like Ed McMahon, like I remember seeing him going door to door with a big check with you know balloons and stuff like this. You know, everybody knows. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, a publisher's clearinghouse and stuff like this, you know, and I was like, okay, that never happened. So that's a yeah. big one. Um, so like, you, you know, uh, some of the movie line changes like, uh, oh, like, you know, in Field of Dream, uh, if you build it, right, they will come. If you build yes. it, they will come. I remember watching that movie, Kevin Costner, you know, yes. when I was a kid, like on VH test uh, with a family. If you build it, they will come. But it never, they never said they. Yeah. You no, know, they now, said now he. he. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. And I remember so, they. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, you know, I, I, and so, and, and the thing is, like, once you start, uh, it, I, I went crazy basically from end of 2018 all the way till like 2021, where I was like spending a lot of time going through like uh, the Mandela effect stuff. Uh, I had to get to the bottom of it. I have this like obsessive mind where I need to figure out this puzzle. I have not figured out the puzzle. I had to take a break, you know, and yes. I still don't know what's going on, but I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay with not knowing what the hell is going on with that. You know, yeah, I just exactly. know that it exists. Yeah. And exactly. that's it. Well, that probably <laughs> would have been your scientific background with, you know, growing up in a scientific sort of, um, so wanting to get to the bottom of what it is and, and yeah, 
Um, but also I think we've been indoctrinated to um, believe from a very young age that that we know everything, you know, like the scientists and the politicians and, you know, the um, quantum position, you know, positions. Um, if, uh, Phys oh, I can't get my word. You know what I'm talking about anyway. I can't get that word yeah. out. Yeah. Um, they they give this air about we know everything. Like no stone has been unturned. Yeah, yeah. You know, all stones have been turned over. There's nothing new under the sun. We know everything there is to know about the earth and, and the cosmos and, and where we are and everything. And it's not until I think, and for me, I'm glad I sort of came across the flat earth first because it kind of, warmed me into e more easily accepting the Mandela effect, not having the answers. It allowed me to get to that point where it was okay to not know. It was okay to say, look, I don't know what this is. I don't know why it's happening. Um, and it, it's actually created more questions than answers, but I think that's good. I think it's good to say that we don't know. Um, and it's exciting to know that there could be more, you know, as, as far as like with the flat earth, there could be more lands that we don't know about, more dimensions, things like that. Um, and with the Mandela effect, it's like, yeah, it it basically is letting us know that reality is fluid. Um, yeah. It's ever changing. Um, it could be our consciousness because as, as humankind or mankind's consciousness raises, maybe our manifestation powers are working um, more um sort of uh, like more quickly i guess and, and on a more broader um level i mean this sort of thing as i say nobody seems to know how far back it goes um but it seems to be even in recent times i've noticed in the last few recent months it seems to actually be accelerating and there seems to be more and more but for me i think the big one was before I even came across the Mandela effect, I remember sex in the city and then it was sex mm. and the city. And I never watched mm. that show. I've never been really a big TV watcher, but obviously I knew about it and, you know, I'd heard people talking about it and I knew Sarah Jessica Parker was one of the main characters in, in the show, one of the main actresses in the show. And I'd always thought oh, it was sex in the city. And then at some point, and I can't remember when it was, but I know it was quite a while before I stumbled across the Mandela effect, which I think was late 2016. And then I heard people refer to it as sex and the city. And I thought, oh, I always thought it was in. Or maybe I got it wrong because I didn't watch it. Um, but then mm. other things, I think the next big one for me was the um, mirror, mirror on the wall because growing up mm -hmm. I was a huge Disney fan like our grandparents you know would take us to watch Disney when they were still at the movie theaters and then when we were children and when my children were growing up my mum you know bought all the Disney movies for them um, at the time we didn't know what Disney was involved in and all the subliminal messages that are in the movies for the kids and things which that's another rabbit hole we could go down but probably not today um, but at the time, just looking at it on face value, it was, you know, as far as we were concerned, it was lighthearted, you know, cartoons and, and animations and entertainment for the kids. So, and I knew I had Disney books and all sorts, and I knew emphatically it was mirror, mirror on the wall. And no. I went to books that I had on my bookshelf that my grandparents had given me right back to the late 70s, early 80s. And I looked in and it had changed to magic mirror. And that's what really spun me mm -hmm. out. I'm like this. And then Bible, I've got Bibles that were my great grandmother and my grandmother's and my mum's Bibles. And I've looked up certain passages and they've now changed. And it was just mind blowing. So, yeah. yeah. So do you yeah. have any like thoughts about what, you you know what are some of the ideas that you think it could be do you think it is our consciousness that's doing it do you think it is possibly creator giving us some some signs and symbols and things like that could it be the adversary could it be a combination yeah i well you know i used to so there were a couple main um like for me, anyway, like the main uh, uh, theories were like, you know, collective consciousness type of thing, you know, that was one of them. 
Uh, this place is a simulation, you know, so uh, that's another uh, explanation. Um, some people believe it's like the demons and the devil, uh, you know, with their black magic. And, you know, and then, you know, obviously Brian thinks that it's God that is doing it. Um, now, I used to believe a little bit more towards like the collective consciousness and like, you know, we are all kind of, you know, a part of this reality. And then, you know, uh, uh, we have psychic powers and stuff like this. But actually, I'm starting to lean towards the idea that God is actually doing it, you know, for mm -hmm. like now more than before. And like when I look at like because like like to me, all of these concepts, whatever conspiracies that we are talking about, you know, it could be Tartaria, it could be Flat Earth, it could be the Mandela effect. I do believe that they're interconnected. Yes. Okay. They do have uh, kind of like, you know, a dot that we need to like, you know, uh, they're not isolated. You know, Mandela effect is not isolated from the flat earth and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And when I think about the big scheme of things, really, um, long story short, you know, like if you believe in God, then he is the ultimate authority. And then everybody else is kind of like, you know, um, a creation of that God, including the demons and the devil, you know, and there's some kind of a agreement uh, that was made. Uh, do I think there's no evil that exists no of course i have my values and i have my ranges of what i believe to be moral and immoral right and uh, what i believe to be right and wrong and all this kind of stuff but all of that is like polarity it's like the hermetic principles that we have to deal with existing in this uh dimension that we find ourselves in and with that uh maybe that gives us the ability to have free will right you know Yes. And so uh, we can exercise our free will by choosing left or right, good or bad, black and white, whatever it might be. OK. And, you know, we need the devil in a way to be able to provide us with that choice, you know. So he's yes. playing a role the way I see it. But yes. the changes themselves. Yes, they are supernatural. I mean, how else to explain it? Are we jumping from one dimension to another, as some people believe? OK, but like who's jumping? Mm -hmm. To what? Like, you know, like uh, I, I remember my kidneys to be somewhere else. I remember my heart to be somewhere else. Yes. You know, so did I jump into somebody else's body or what? What is going on? Because what's with all this like memory stuff, you yeah. know, what's like and then how do we know it's not a mismemory? That's the, the, that's another big question. How do we how do we know that we're not going senile? We're not uh, going crazy. You know, maybe we're becoming uh, schizophrenic. I don't know. Yeah. Right. But the I, thing to know is that we're, yeah, uh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. No, I, just by finish saying, like, we all are having the same mismemories, mm. right? We're all having the same mismemories. Like, if the, if we were off about some memory, we should be rem uh, uh, remembering black cards or red cards or, like, they, it could be a, a magic mirror or some other type of mirror. So we could we should be all over the board, but ninety percent of the time, when there is a Mandela effect, and people agree during, they all agree to the same memory. Yeah. That's the yes. thing, and that's why I like what Brian does because when he's introducing people to the Mandela effect, he he doesn't lead them. He mm -hmm. asks them the question to you know, mm -hmm. uh, oh, do you remember, um, you know. I can't even think off the top of my head now. There's thousands of them and I've just gone blank. But yeah, yeah he, his <laughs> thing is about if I if I locked 100 people in a grocery store and asked them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what sort of avocados, you know, do you know? 90% yes. 90, 90 of the people would say, or 99% would say, Haas avocados, and it's never yes. been Haas, yeah. it's now Haas, as we know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, you're right, because if it was individual memories failing, we would have so many thousands of different um answers whereas everyone seems to most people it, not in all cases but most people the majority of them have what we used to remember it as and also there's so much residual evidence and there's um you know when there's parodies done or people have had artwork done like the thinker statue is mm -hmm. one for me mm -hmm that I definitely remember the thinker statue with his, you know, hand, obviously, his fist up to his forehead. And yeah. um, and that makes sense too because it's touching the the mind, the third eye, you're thinking, yeah. you know, the head, the mind, the thinker, thinking. 
um, and it's changed a couple of times now. And mm-hmm. Brian has showed on his show where people have um, gone and like tourist buses, or, you know, busloads of tourists have rocked up and they're all doing the pose the old way and behind them the statue's doing it the new way. So there's so much residual. Um, so I don't know how people can um, not see it or say that it's just people's memories, you know. So that that's another part of the puzzle is why why can some people see it and other people can't? Um, yeah, that. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's, well, I think it's because that, you know, if you don't think it's a possibility, you know, in the first place, then you're not going to look for the reasons as you're going to look for all the reasons why it's not that, you know, I mean, it's like, and in terms of like Occam's razor is concerned, like logically speaking, uh, they are more in the right because actually 99% of the Mandela effect is uh, with your memory. And then we have the 1%, maybe more, I don't know, like, but like, I would say it's like, you have the residue. Yes. You know, and then, but people can always explain that away. Well, that's artistic rendition. Somebody made a mistake and said that, uh, you know, uh, the Statue of Liberty is on Ellis Island. Okay. They made a coin with it, you know, and maybe, uh, they, they received the wrong information because we have, uh, you know, uh, Liberty Island now and uh, Alice Island now, which, uh, you know, for me, I never remembered uh, uh, Liberty Island uh, whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, like they can explain it away and they can be satisfied with that explanation. You know, yeah. it's not proof per se for them. Yes. So really the proof is uh, we are like, it's like, you know, my mother's name is this, you know, as an example. And it's like, well, like, how, how can you, well, it's my mother's name. Like, I, I, I've i spent, like, you know, many, many years with her, all my life with her, you know, yeah. like, it's my mother's name. How would I not remember my mother's name as an example? You know, it's like some yeah. of these memories, we have like anchor memory. We know why exactly, because it, we're telling, that that's how we remember things. There's a yeah. story that goes along with yeah. that memory. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, with the heart, like my grandfather taught me about which side the heart was on because, um, no, sorry, he taught me which side to wear my watch. Um, back when I was a kid, mm. I used to wear wrist watches. Um, mm-hmm. I can't wear them. I haven't for years because they always seem to speed up, slow down or stop. So I've got a thing with, you know, time pieces. But as a kid, when I was learning to tell the time, I think my grandparents bought me a wrist watch. And I was always confused as to which wrist to wear it on. And I don't know whether it's the same with people these days that wear wristwatches, but back in the 60s and early 70s, um, wristwatches were predominantly worn or pretty much all the time worn on the left hand. But being such a little kid, I think I might have only been about, I don't know, maybe six when I got my first wristwatch. And I remember uh, my grandfather said, you always know which hand to which wrist to put the watch on because it's the same side of the body that your heart is on and that's on the left so and that stuck with me and so when I found out a few years ago that the heart's never been on the left in this reality now that we're currently living in it's in the center there there is a slight bit but it's definitely more centralized now whereas before it was pretty much all on the left um yeah. yeah, that that was a big shock to me. And the kidneys too, because I used to ride yeah. bike, you know, I've ridden bikes, you know, most of my life. And a lot of my friends used to ride dirt bikes and the guys always used to wear the kidney belts, you know, so mm. that they wouldn't damage their kidneys. And, and also in boxing, you know, you, you couldn't yeah. do a kidney punch and things like that. And yeah, so things like yeah. that were just, yeah. Um, but I, yeah I mean, I remember the, the like the pledge of allegiance when i was in school and we have to pledge you know uh to the flag and then they would always tell us you know put your hand over your heart yes on the left hand side hand over the heart left hand side yes yeah yeah it's crazy and um yeah and the fact that yeah um like getting back to residual you know like there's just Mm -hmm. there's so much out there for it um yeah. to yeah how people can still not see it it really baffles me but i guess a lot of people just don't it's it's an uncomfortable truth i guess they just they're in their little lane they've got their blinkers on they don't want to look at really what's going on so <laughs> we can call them npcs whether they are or not i don't know what are your thoughts on that whole 
that whole line of thinking? Do you think I mean, there are a certain you know, amount of humanity that are just here as players, um, you know, to help us on our journey through our soul evolution? I'm not sure. Like, uh, I mean, it's some, I mean, we like, it's kind of hard for me to say like, definitively because like you know sometimes when i hear that uh i feel it's a little bit derogatory yeah you know uh and then trying to like put people down because like everybody's on a path you know and yep. we have to uh uh try to show some compassion and love as much as we can to our fellow uh human beings even if they're fast asleep you know and a lot of people say well who cares if the earth is flat or uh, if the mandela effect is real i still have to go to work and and pay you know my taxes and go to the grocery store and stuff like this and they're not wrong yeah. in that in in their mentality you know i mean like if you ever you know observed anybody who had to work 12 14 hours for like a couple bucks a you know a a, a day you know yeah. they're not going to care about anything that we're talking about at all mm. you know they're just yeah. there to survive yeah you know? and it's it's not their soul's journey this time around because without Maybe not. yeah without sounding like there's a hierarchy of souls because i think we all end up you know we all come from source and we all end up you know going back to source but we're journeying at the moment i guess through um different dimensions and different realities and things and so some of us are in kindergarten some of us are in primary school um and some of us are in you know high school or you know college yeah. or university so um but eventually i guess you know we'll, we'll all get there and what you were saying before too about the um the adversary and having to have the darker um side um you know to sort of balance and have that uh, polarities um i very much am you know the same thought as you especially with the work that i've been doing with the soul-centered healing hypnosis and i've known for a long time anyway that there's definitely you know darker energies and darker forces and demonic type um beings that we um we learn just as much from them as we do the monk <laughs> in fact probably more yeah. so more so really sure yeah 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 like i just think it's just that you know uh we are here to learn until our last breath and then we're probably going to learn more even after you know so uh I, I i think like to feel satisfied about like you know having known everything there's always going to be some surprise yeah. You know, and uh, like the flat earth and the Mandela effect for me were those surprises. And it helps me to be more humble and open to other possibilities that could exist in terms of experience, in terms of understanding, in terms of like um, seeing the truth about this reality. And, you know, more as I progress, I would say, is that less I want to talk about like God or less I want to talk about the Mandela effect and stuff like this, because when people are ready for that information, you know, nobody can stop them. You know, yeah. nobody can stop you from finding out the truth about this world if you are really like going after it and, and you know, doing uh, putting all your effort in. Nobody can stop you. You know, God will find a way for you. I 100 yeah. percent believe that. So but God, God also gives you as much as you can handle, you know, at that time. And so, you know, maybe it's, you know, we we bite a little bit off and chew on it a little bit and then, you know, and then digest it. And then uh, maybe we'll be ready for more or not. Yeah. You know, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think it's here for, um, you know, it, it's giving us signs and symbols it's teaching us to be discerning and um, also, yeah, yeah um, that, yeah, as I said before, to know that the nature of reality is fluid and it's not set. And it also, yeah. it's empowering because it, it, it gives us the power as well to know that we actually do create our own reality through our thoughts, feelings and emotions and our intentions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I pretty much already was on that line of thought before I came across the Mandela effect, but that kind of even concreted it in even more for me. So you just said before, like, we're still, oh, sorry, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I just want to say that, like, yes, I mean, in this real, realm, there is uh, uh, an appearance of free will. Some people say there is free will. Some people say there is not free will. 
but like really what does it mean do you do you have the ability to choose i guess that's the the some people have the ability to choose maybe more than somebody else it's kind of very relative but at the end of the day everything belongs to god as far as i'm concerned and so it's just about trying to polish our egos as much as we can that's a choice you yeah. can choose to do that or you can choose not to do that and then maybe you polish it enough where it doesn't exist anymore you know if I, i'm not there yet you know like my my uh, uh my stone is quite rough uh still after all this work and but at least i understand that yeah. there is a stone to be polished and to be worked on you know that's yeah. all right but that's yeah. a choice yeah exactly yeah because i've heard crow talk about the different um realms above us and like the angelic mm -hmm realms where they actually don't have free will and a lot of people mm -hmm. were horrified you know when he said that but i think for me all that means is they are just so in um the presence of the you know divine i guess for want of a better word there's not they don't have to make a choice they don't have to mm -hmm. because they're already um in that divinity if you know what i mean they're already living breathing yeah. or you know that they're they're it's, aligned you know they're, yeah they're, they're, aligned. they're already aligned yeah so they don't actually have to make a choice yeah yeah so um what are your thoughts on um near-death experiencing uh, experiences mm. or um you know life after death life before birth what what are your thoughts on that uh i i talked about this before but like i believe i've had a near-death experience when i was in high school uh it was a very unique experience i'd never had a another experience like that basically i had a, a slight uh out of body where i kind of saw a little version of me like i was laying on the ground and i kind of slightly like see myself like just but not completely like floating above and stuff like this and then uh i i don't know uh for how long but then i uh, i can remember i can remember being in a state of timelessness spacelessness but i still had a sense of individuality it was a very and but i can remember like i can recall this very well like almost like any time because it was such a strong impression that it never went away from me and so basically what it came down to is like everything was white and i was trying to look for my body but I couldn't, everything is white, you know, everything is bright light. So I cannot distinguish my hand from anything else, but I could sense that I had myself that was separate somehow, but I couldn't see myself. But the feeling that this was like, you know, this is like bliss. This is like a being like a baby in the mother's womb or something like this. Maybe these are the best ways for me to, but it just felt right and comfortable and you know safe and you know like like just it's like it was timelessness being there you know and yeah. i was it was and i just like you know you're not like thinking about i don't remember thinking about my parents or friends or my body i just was like uh like that you know like just there and yeah. you don't know how much time passes because there's no distinction between one moment to another there's no movement yeah. whatsoever you just feel okay and content and good. And uh, there was a little bit of a moment of me trying to like find myself, but then after you fail at doing so, you don't care anymore. Yeah. You know, it's so just you like just you're there. <laughs> surrender. Yeah. So did that happen yeah. through an, an accident or was it just when you were, um, like, was it uh, when you it were was asleep? through alcohol? Oh, uh, yeah. Like I, like I was a little bit of like a straight, straight edge kid you know like i was like you know uh, and then i went to like a house party at my friend's place out in the farm and we bought like a lot of alcohol and i was really overdoing it and then we were smoking up uh like in the middle and then drinking some more um and uh, i lost complete control you know like i i like passed out on the floor my friends i could feel that they were like slapping me and they were like shaking me yeah. And I wanted to tell them I'm okay. It was really weird. Like I felt like so clear, yeah. you know, at that moment when they were like, like shaking me and slapping me. And then uh, uh, I lost like uh, my consciousness, you know, and, and went into the different state. 
Um, when I woke up in the morning, everybody was gone except for that one kid who uh, was the the son of the house where we were doing the party because I think everybody was afraid that actually uh, they had to deal with a dead body there. The yeah. first thing I did is finding a bucket and I like projectile vomited uh, yeah. into the uh, bucket. And then uh, my friend drove me home. And I remember the, the whole day I was thinking about that experience. And I was thinking like, did my brain wire go off? I couldn't speak to anybody about it because not that I was ashamed of it. I just didn't know how to articulate what I had experienced. Yeah. And only when I went to university and when I was be, uh, you know, studying uh, psychology, uh, I took a class on parapsychology when I was a freshman. And, you know, they were talking about ESP and all this stuff, but they had a section on near-death experiences. And when I was reading that chapter, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is like so much like the experience that I had, you know, like the tunnel of light and not quite like that, but like, you know, like this white light and, you know, like uh, uh, floatiness and all this kind of stuff, you know, like this association with your body, uh, it all lined up. So that's why I associate. And I've never had another experience like that. Yeah. I wanted to get drunk more and more and more actually after that point to induce myself to get to a point where I could have another experience like that. But I never had another experience like that. Yeah. Even with my breakthrough DMT experience, it, it, that was a very unique once in a lifetime experience for me yeah. you know yeah yeah i and um i'm fascinated with near death experiences i haven't had one um like that i've had a couple of moments um there was one time when i was a very young child it was before we left england so it would have been before i was 7 um i've got a feeling i was probably closer to infancy maybe two three and I was in my parents bed we, we used to go in and snuggle with my parents on Sunday mornings we were allowed to jump in the middle of our parents and snuggle in bed while they had a few more minutes sleep in and it, this was back in the 60s and mum had some paisley print um, curtains in the bedroom and I remember staring at the curtains and all of a sudden it was like I filled the room it was like my consciousness had come out of my body and I filled the room and I was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but I didn't feel that I had a body. It was more that I was just an energy or something. And I kind of projected myself into the pattern in the curtains and became the colours and the the pattern of that paisley print in the curtains. It was just so bizarre. It, it, I can't, still can't really explain fully how it felt. And I don't even remember how I sort of got back into my body, um, but that's all I really remember about that. And the only other experiences uh, experience I had was I was nearly drowned when I was about, I think I was about eight or nine, and I was held under in a swimming pool um, by the, a girl I didn't even know. We're at a public pool and I'm just splashing around and my parents were further up. And because I was quite a competent swimmer, um, you know, they knew that I was okay down in the shallow end of the pool. But there was this teenage girl, unbeknownst to me, I must have been annoying her because I was splashing her and she came and she just held me under and just put her whole body weight on me. And I can oh remember gosh. just, yeah, and I was fighting and the more I was fighting, the more she was pushing me. And I remember I got to the point where I, just, I thought I was going to die and I um, could see just blurrily because I didn't have goggles on. I could see other swimmers around me under the water, legs moving and things like that. And then everything just went black and I just let go. And as soon as I did that, I must have gone limp and she's obviously panicked and she's let go of me. And then next minute I just bobbed up to the surface of the water and came to as, as if like and coughing and spluttering and, and, and then managed to get my breath and scream out for mum. Yeah. But so I don't know whether I actually left my body, but I got to the point, I think, where I was just about to disconnect and everything in front of me had just gone black. So, but I've always been fascinated in NDEs and OBEs and I read Robert Munro's books when I was like in my teens and um, early 20s and things like that. So, yeah, I just I loved and also reincarnation. I've read many books on people that have had reincarnation experiences and and that's why mm -hmm. I love the work I do with the Soul Centre Healing Hypnosis because it also involves a little bit of what well, we call it past life regression. But I 
I think that term past life is a little bit redundant um, now that we know that everything, you know, time isn't linear. So, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, you mentioned earlier that you had an experience where you tapped into one of your, um, you know, so-called past lives. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, um, it's it's not so vivid uh, of a thing. It's not about the tapping into my past experience, but it's more of a, uh, like I went to a, a, you know, in India, they have these uh, rishis. You know, they, they, they are like a, a family lineage who believe that they come from one of the eight great rishis of, you know, Indian lore, where they are the, the, the ones who brought like knowledge, the Vedic knowledge into Indian culture. So there's a family in a place uh, in a city called Haridwar, which is near Rishikesh. You know, Rishikesh is where like all these like people go and do yoga stuff. You know, Haridwar is like half an hour away from there. My uh, Russian girlfriend and I were interested in to uh, interested in knowing about our charts and how would we actually match uh, astrologically uh, uh, using using uh, Vedic astrology or Jyotishya, uh, some people say. You know, so we decided to go to this family, and you know they have a temple, and 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 you know they come from a lineage of uh, astrologers, and uh, they're very like, you know, they don't accept money they accept donations but there's no like cost to do this. so they like you know gave us a room to stay and then the the gentleman who was so whole family are astrologers so there was like a a, a husband a wife uh two kids and a grandfather guy and the grandfather guy it was like 80 years old back back then and that was like 2016. i'm not sure if he's around anymore to be honest and um and he didn't speak a lot of English at all, at all. So my girlfriend, luckily, she spoke Hindi uh, and she was translating uh, uh, what he was saying. But basically, he was saying, looking at our chart, he was looking at my chart specifically. And then he was looking at, uh, you know, our kind of connection. And he was saying that we were both like, uh, you know, Tibetan monks in our past lives. Uh, and then we both came to Nepal. We met in Nepal. He doesn't know about that information about us. Yeah. But that's where we met. Uh, uh, but, you know, we didn't tell him about like, you know, uh, our you know, details so much. And uh, he said that we were both monks. And then, you know, my girlfriend is like a Buddhist. Like she's she's also into Vipassana. Uh, she like says that she's a Buddhist. I never considered myself a Bo Buddhist myself. Yeah. Um, so we were both monks. And then we, I guess, fell in love, met in Nepal. And then we decided to have like a regular like lifestyle. And then uh, uh, we actually came, both of us moved away from Nepal to the area that where I am living now. And, you know, my girlfriend actually brought me to this area uh, in the Kulu Valley. And that's where we uh, settled. But that's where we split apart in our past life, which actually we we're like, you know, <laughs> doing that again we yeah. are no longer together and we kind of split apart uh you know i continue to live here she's like she st still loves this area and she comes to visit every once in a while um but we're no longer together you know and and she's doing her thing and she's going on her path and i'm going on my path yeah um but we were together for that duration of the time so yeah so i i and like i said before like i have like a strong connection to the tibetan like, I feel like if I go to Tibet, like, it's my home. You know, yeah. I really feel like I'm okay there. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. Um, I've never, well, I, I might have been to Scotland when I was an infant, but I don't have conscious memories. But I feel very um, connected to Scotland. So I've often wondered whether I've had, you know, um, lives in Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, but doing this soul-centered healing hypnosis work has just been, um, you know, wonderful to, um, you know, help people to tap into things that they may have had in other lives that have affected them in this life and how they can then heal in this life, which then ultimately heals all lives across, you know, all time, dimension and space. Yeah. So yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah it's just lovely. Yeah. Work is now. I mean, it's not about yeah. the future. It's about you have to you have to get out of the uh, generational trauma now. Yes. You know, and exactly. uh, not someday, 
think yeah. we've got to work on it now. And, yes. uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, this guy. I think his name is Michael Newton. He talked about like, you know, the journey of souls, yep. destiny of souls, stuff yes. like that. So he was also a hypnotist and he was hypnotizing people and then find out, found out more about their uh, past life regression and stuff like this. Uh, I was really into this material called Seth Speaks. Yes. And, you know, yeah, Seth was sure, talking yeah. about like, you know, uh, how like, you know, all these dimensions coexist you know, co you know, like, like at the same time, there's no yeah. past life that's still happening right now. Yes. This life is happening right now. Future life is happening right now. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I read this death material too. Um, Jane Roberts and, um, her partner. Yep. Yeah. Robert, but, but I think his name was, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't know whether it was in the Seth material, but I think when I was um, sort of in my twenties and I was trying to wrap my head around the fact that time's not linear, um, I think the analogy that was drawn was you've got three train stations. You've got train station A, train station B and train station C. And as the train's going through train station A, it doesn't mean that B and C aren't still existing. It's just you're not there yet. But then when you go through to train station B, a still exists, but your consciousness or, or the train isn't there. It's it's moved forward, but doesn't mean that train station A doesn't exist. And train station C mm. is still existing there, but you're just not there yet. So that was how, um, but that's a very simplistic, um, you know, version. Because um, there's a guy that I've been looking at on YouTube in recent months called Darius J. Wright. He's American born, but he's now living in Australia. And he actually does um, NDEs at will and he teaches people how to do it. He's been doing it his whole life. Um, it started involuntary as a child, but he learned how to um, sort of harness what was going on and now do it sort of more in a controlled environment, uh, in a controlled way. And he um, talks about um, time as being almost like stacked upon you know, like layers, levels and layers upon, and you can look down at, and it's one thing, but there's also different layers and levels to it. So, yeah, but his work's really interesting and, um, uh, yeah, just going into the different dimensions, going into the halls of Amente and the Akashic records and things like that. It's just so fascinating um, to know yeah. that we, we can all have access to all this this stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been on for nearly two hours, so I guess it's probably time to wind it down for today. Or we could, I could keep talking for another another hour or two, but I've got things I've got to go and do now, and yeah. I guess I'd better let you get on with the rest of your day. So I'm am so appreciative that um, you took the time to come on my podcast today. So where can yeah. people find you, Nachiketa? So. Uh, well, you know, they can come to my channel, you know, and check out what I do over there. Uh, basically, um, everything that we talked about is something that uh, uh, I'm, you know, more or less interested in, um, you know, exploring far further. I mean, like, I'm, I've am i already been a flat earther. Everybody knows I'm a flat earther, but, you know, but like, you know, uh, and I talk about the Mandela effect. And so we speculate about, you know, uh, what are some other possibilities or uh, uh, spiritual uh and like for me, it's about spirituality and how does Mandela effect and, you know, uh, flat earth and the conspiracies, how do they fit into the spiritual uh, uh, aspect of things? You know, like, yeah. what are we here to learn? You know, how are we supposed to wise up? Nowadays, I'm really getting into this kind of alternate history type stuff, because actually that's a, a piece of the puzzle that's been um, very much needed for me to really understand, like, you know, how we came to be where we are now you know, in terms of like history is concerned, like actual, yes. uh, genuine, real history. Yes. And uh, um, yeah, so like that's been a, a, a big interest to me. And uh, I've been getting into the Quran actually a lot. Uh, so I feel like this is a time now for me to uh, get to know a little bit more about what the Quran has to say, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with Christianity. I'm somewhat familiar with Hinduism. I'm somewhat familiar with uh, Buddhism. But uh, the Quran is something that I didn't really get into. I never really took it very seriously until this year. And now I'm finding it to be very fascinating, actually. There's a lot of stuff in there that I took it for granted. And it's now time for me to uh, learn a little bit more about that. So that's kind of the journey that I'm on right now. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll leave your link to your YouTube channel in the description below. 
so people can yeah. um, go over and subscribe to your channel and um, if they're interested and, and watch your videos. But um, yeah, again, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, it's thank you. Such a pleasure. Yeah, yes. I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No thank worries. you very much. So uh, and I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, if people want to email me or something like that, they can uh, 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 send me an email. I'm open. Uh, I have that one email for the public if they are uh, curious about whatever. I'm usually, you know, responding to every email. Um, yeah. you you know, I don't say, get a whole lot anyways. Do you want to say what your email yeah. is on the sh on line now? And then I'll, um, I'll still put yeah. the link below. It's but... uh, Nachiketa. It's N-A-C-H-I-K-E-T-A 361 at gmail.com. Great. No worries. So, yeah, people can get in touch with you. And, um, yes, yeah, so thank thanks, everyone, for joining us today on uh, Caravan of Consciousness. I'm not sure when I'll get this up, but like I said, it is, um, I think it was the, yeah, 23rd of March today, Saturday the 23rd of March, but it'll be up in the next few days. And, um, yeah, just want to wish everyone um, uh, blessings, a great weekend and a great week ahead. Okay, thanks, everyone. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the